morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, you sound great in there. Uh, I was thrilled when Ollie accepted my application to do this a second time. I did this at the Beaufort campus last semester, and it didn't occur to me until fairly recently to look at the time. I thought, oh, Monday morning, who's going to show up for that? And here you all are, so thank you for doing that. Um, Yes, as, as my bio, my you know, short bio says, I'm the director of the Pat Conroy Literary Center, founding director of the Pat Conroy Festival, the annual festival, and the former director of the University of South Carolina Press. And I'll talk a little bit about all of those things because they all relate to how I know Pat and what I know about Pat. Um, what I will do primarily go straight through for two hours. So if you have a question that relates to where we are right at that point in the presentation, and you think we will collectively benefit from your question, by all means ask it. But if I do this well and I don't go off on too many tangents, we will end with a good bit of time at the end for questions. So if you have general questions about the center or about Pat Conroy, we'll take them up at the end. Does that sound fair? Yes. You do sound great in here. It's <laughs> wonderful. Well, as director of the Pat Conroy Literary Center, I've tried to explain to people uh, what I do, and at sort of the most basic level, I get to tell Pat Conroy stories for a living. That's my job. And that sounds wonderful. If you're a Conroy fan, that probably sounds like an incredible job. But there's one inherent, inescapable difficulty of telling Pat Conroy stories for a living. And that's that there used to be this other guy who would go around telling Pat Conroy stories for a living. You may have heard of him. His name was Pat Conroy. <laughs> so the bar has been set really, really high for doing this kind of thing because Pat was an incredible storyteller, natural born storyteller. And what we're going to do today is honor part of Pat's life, the central part of Pat's life, I would argue, and that's his reverence for teaching as both a student, a lifelong learner, as all of you are, by virtue of being here, and as a teacher and mentor, too, I think those two things define Pat's life. We will go almost through his entire life. Uh, we will talk about Pat's very first memory, which was from the high chair. He will get to tell you that story in a video clip. And we'll talk about Pat's absolute last act as a teacher, which has to do with where he is buried. So we're going virtually from, from birth to death in this story. But just to make sure we all know who we're talking about, this is our guy. Donald Patrick Conroy, born October 26, 1945, died March 4, 2016. The author of 12 books so far. I say so far because unpublished Pat Conroy books are still working their way toward publication. 11 of these books were published in his lifetime, and then the 12th, The Little Country Heart, was published posthumously. As you probably know, four of them were made into major motion pictures. One of them twice, 1974, Conrad with John Voigt, which was then remade by Hallmark Hall of Fame as the film The Water is Wide. 1979, The Great Santini. 1983, The Lords of Discipline. And 1991, The Prince of Tides, Pat's most, favorite, uh, most famous novel. Interestingly, uh, as relates to today's topic, all of these novels and all of the films have to do with teaching in one way or another. Conrad, story of a teacher. Great Santini, story in part of a high school student. Lords of Discipline, story of a military college student. Prince of Tides, story of a disgraced teacher and coach. And you find this in all of Pat's books, almost without exception. There's always a teacher, there's always a student. Even in the book that Pat was writing when he passed away, Storms of Aquarius, he was going back to writing about his first years as a teacher. He was coming back to that story yet again. And it's in the capacity of being a teacher that I met Pat, although it wasn't in the classroom. When I was director of the University of South Carolina Press, I wanted to create an original fiction imprint. I wanted to publish short stories and novels, not just occasionally, as the press had done over its then 70-year history, but to do it purposefully to actually seek out the absolute best writers I could find, help them be better at their craft, and share their stories with readers. And Pat Conroy, to the absolute surprise of me and many of his friends, not only liked the idea, he volunteered to be the editor at large, or the editor at larger than life, as we call it, of Story River Books. 
And the name itself, Story River Books, uh, meant a lot to Pat. We were originally going to call it the Palmetto Fiction Project, or the Palmetto Fiction Series. And I was reading a manuscript of a children's book set here in the Low Country, and I found a reference to Story River, and I thought it was made up. I thought, that's too beautiful a name, that's too romantic sounding, that can't be a real place, but it is. It's a river that runs between Fripp Island and Pritchard's Island. And as a teenager, Pat Conroy swam in that river. So when I told him I wanted to name this fiction imprint Story River Books, he said that sounded like destiny. That was a place he knew and loved. He had a couple of stipulations for being editor at large of this project. One was that he not be paid a dime of royalty. And you can imagine I immediately agreed to that, because that fit my budget very well. I could not have afforded to pay Pat what he was worth, so not having to pay him anything was ideal. His other stipulation was that he wanted to open Story River books up to writers from outside of South Carolina. He certainly wanted to start with South Carolina, because that's where he had started. But he wanted to invite, it, invite Southern writers beyond the state as well, which we absolutely did. In all, 22 books were selected for Story River Books, and the 22nd, Anthony Groom's novel, The Vain Conversation, comes out next month. So in some ways, Pat's hand is still guiding that series. But rather than have me just tell you about it, I want to share what Pat said about Story River Books, because this too relates to being a teacher and a student. This is from his editor's statement. South Carolina has given me a million stories, and no writer who ever lived had such riches to choose from. This is the reason I offered to edit the Story River Books imprint for USC Press. What I owe South Carolina is not repayable, but I started out as a kid in Buford who wanted to be a writer, and I didn't have the slightest notion how to become one. With this new fiction imprint, I believe I can help bring out voices in this state that might not be heard otherwise, and those as of yet unheard voices can help reshape our world. That's a beautiful statement, very ambitious. And I hope we did some of that. In a much more succinct statement in an interview at a book festival, Pat said simply this, Story River Books is a gift to writers and to readers. And I don't think he just meant the writers we were publishing in Story River or the readers of just those books. I think he meant all writers and all readers because he was showing what was still possible. The stories that weren't otherwise going to get published in large-scale publishing, but could at a much smaller press based here in South Carolina. And all of this relates to how Pat wanted to teach writers and readers through Story River Books. He wasn't just the editor-in-chief. He was our tribal elder. He was a mentor to these writers. Case in point, Pat, who again was not earning a dime in royalty from these books, would go out on tour with our writers. He would go to events with the writers, many of whom no one had ever heard of before, but everybody had heard of Pat Conroy. He was crowd insurance. People would show up to hear Pat, and if our writers were any good, the audience would learn about them over the course of that time. Well, one of those events was at Furman University, and Furman is the basketball and football rival of the Citadel, Pat's alma mater. So that was particularly fun to take Pat to Furman University, where we were welcomed, and we did a talk that that night with the novelist Elizabeth Cox, uh, John Lane, Eric Morris, and Mark Sibley Jones. Betsy and John are well known, they have many books. Uh, Eric and Mark were both there with their very first novel. They were relatively unknown. We had about 300 people come out that night, everybody there to see Pat, of course. And during the course of that hour presentation, Pat put all of the attention on those other writers. He said very little, if anything, about himself. He kept the conversation about them and their books. And afterwards, there was a signing line, and Pat and I sat down at a table for about three to four hours, which was actually fairly short by Conroy signing line standards. And people were bringing up to Pat copies of his own books. There were people there that night with first edition copies of the Boo that had been signed by the Boo and by Pat, which touched his heart greatly. But nothing moved him quite so much as when someone would come up to him and ask him to sign a book by one of these other writers, not by him. At the end of those three hours, when virtually everyone had left, Pat finally stood up stretched a little bit, and he put one hand on each of my shoulders and looked me square in the eye and said, Jonathan, 
I have never worked so hard in my life selling books by other writers. <laughs> and I thought I was going to get him. I said, Pat, they're your writers. But he was a good teacher. And he said to me, no, they're our writers. And the whole idea that Pat Conroy and I would have something that was ours meant everything to me, as he knew it would. And I said, but Pat, do you love it? And he smiled, that great big Pat Conroy smile. I said, yes, I absolutely love it. That night, he showed those writers on stage how to treat an audience. He educated them, and he educated that audience about these new writers. And it was like that every time we went out together. It was Pat being a teacher again, and that was remarkable to see. We're going to go backward in time now from that Pat to this Pat. Because it's hard to talk about Pat without talking about Pat's family. He couldn't do it, so why should I? <laughs> Here's a great line about the Conroys, which Pat wrote in The Death of Santini. For a long time, I thought I was born into a mythology instead of a family. That is a very important sentence because it shapes Pat's entire viewpoint of the world. He thinks of his parents as larger-than-life figures, and in many ways they are. So he thinks of the entire rest of the world in this larger-than-life scenario. Everything is always on an epic scale. Pat was often accused of exaggerating. His response was that life had exaggerated to him. That's Pat's dad, Don Conroy, call sign the great Santini. Born in Chicago, Irish Catholic, that's Peg Conroy, Pat's mother, born in the backwoods beyond the backwoods, very rural Georgia. That's Pat in the back, uh, probably about the time he was teaching at Defusky Island, it'd be about the right age. He's the oldest of seven siblings. This is Sister Carol here, Sister Kathy there, Brother Jim, Brother Mike, uh, Tom there, and Tim the youngest there. Pat's dad was one of the most highly decorated Marine Corps aviators of his generation. Pat's mother uh, did not have much access to public education, but she filled in the gaps through public libraries. And I do a whole talk about Pat's relationship with libraries as well. But I want to share just one part of that with you in this video clip. There we are. This is Mother's Day, 2015. Pat is on stage at USC Buford Center for the Arts. The woman next to him won't speak in this clip, but that's Catherine Seltzer, Pat's biographer. And she has asked him for some memories of his mother, which he shares, but he also talks about his father a little bit. And I want you to pay attention to how those two forces uh, are reflected in Pat's story and his memory. Well, here's what I loved about the mother. Well, the first of all, she was beautiful. She simply was glorious. When I, I asked my brother and sister, why are we good like, like <laughs> and My sister girl said, because she married the beast. <laughs> and we all take after the beast. And, it, and she was lovely. And I remember, you know, and what I remember a lot about is when I was a baby. And I, I started the memory part of my life very early. And I can remember being in the high chair. One horrible image I have from that high chair, I can tell you where it was. It was in a place called Lighter Than Air, a uh, base that was uh, headquarters of it, not far from El Toro in California. And I always grew up loving that place. We were stationed at Lighter Than Air. And it, I remember my father beating my mother to the floor and, uh, and mom screaming and crying and me crying as a baby from the high chair. And I remember that was my first conscious thought and that was my welcome to the world. And that was the world that I was born into. My mother was the soft part of that world, the wonderful part of that world. The part of the world that gave me a love for language, she read it to me and my sister Carol, our whole childhood. When I published the death of Santini, my brother Tim is particularly bitter. I did not know this, but Mom put reading to the kids <laughs> after Carol and I got older. And then, you know, Kathy with four kids came out with it. How many of you all came? <laughs> but you said you're laughing, like it's five, five kids came. She didn't read to them. So all my younger brothers and sisters are dopes. <laughs> and, and they don't have any of the 
uh, you, this thing, but Mom did read to us religiously. I can remember her reading in her voice, her southern voice, the sound of her voice, and that affected me. It, mostly it was her softness, her protection of me from Dad, her trying to wait in the battle when Dad would be knocking wrestlers around. Mom would fight. So his earliest memory is one of violence, yeah. of his father knocking his mother to the ground. But uh, for all the violence, for all the physicality that his father represents to him, his mother represents the softness and the intellectual side. And Pat is a result of both of those forces. They both shaped him. And you have to understand that to understand how Pat will relate to his teachers, what he's looking for when he starts encountering mentors later in his life. One more thing about Pat's mother before we leave his parents. And this relates to how libraries and books impacted her life. This is from My Reading Life. Mom outread a whole generation of officers' wives, but still wilted in embarrassment when asked about her college degree. When I was a teenager, I heard Mom claim that she had just finished her first year at Agnes Scott when she dropped out to marry my father. By the time I graduated the Citadel, Mom was saying she had matriculated with honors from Agnes Scott with a degree in English. Her vast reading provided all the armor she needed to camouflage her lack of education. The library could show you everything if you knew where to look. So Pat is learning fiction from his mother as well, the ability to reinvent yourself, but also the path to self-improvement is through books, through education. If you want to become a better version of yourself, you do it through learning. And those lessons also shape Pat's whole life. In his memoir, uh, My Losing Season, how many of you have read that? Oh, quite a few of you, great. There's a great line that we quote quite a bit at the Conroy Center, and it's this. The great teachers of the world fill you up with hope and shower you with a thousand reasons to embrace all aspects of life. That's a great line, I love that. And in isolation, it sounds like it's about all teachers. But in the context of that book, Pat is writing about one teacher very specifically, Joseph Monty from Gonzaga High School in Washington, DC. Pat's sophomore year, it's the year before the family moves to Beaufort, South Carolina. And it's the first time Pat encounters one of these larger than life teacher mentors. We're gonna spend most of this talk talking about Pat's relationship to teachers and students in Beaufort. But to get him there, I wanna share you a little bit with you about Joseph Monty who I think is a fascinating figure in Pat's life. Again, he's a sophomore in high school when he encounters Dr. Uh, Joseph Monte. And this is the, the full quote in which that short piece appears. I took one crown jewel from my Jesuit immersion at Gonzaga High School. When the scholarly, charismatic Joseph Monte walked into our classroom that first day, he radiated an owl-like authority and a passion for literature I'd never come across. He brought his love for books and words and fine writing to us every day that year, and he thunderstruck me with the mesmerizing power of his teaching. The great teachers of the world fill you up with hope and shower you with a thousand reasons to embrace all aspects of life. I wanted to follow Mr. Monty around for the rest of my life, learning everything he wished to share or impart. So at the age of 15, 16, Pat is encountering this figure who is teaching him already to love books and learning, but also inspiring him to want to be a teacher. Joseph Monty had this list of 100 books he wanted all of his students to read before they went to college. Not only did Pat read all 100 of those books, his mother, Peg Conroy, read all of them as well before Pat went to the Citadel. So she was continuing to benefit from Pat's immersion into education and to the teachers he was meeting. As I said, and as Pat says here, he met Pat met Joseph Monty when he was about 15 or 16. I met him when I was 44 because he walked into the Conroy Center one day completely unannounced just to surprise us. And this is uh, Joe Monty, age 85, still actively involved in teaching in his Sunday school and in his local teachers union. Just an incredible figure in Pat's life and it was great to be able to share the Conroy Center with him. So, from Gonzaga, we go to Buford. Conroy's move here in 1961. This is Pat Conroy as a high school junior. Here he is as a high school senior. These are yearbook photos, obviously. They come because Colonel Conroy has been assigned to the Buford Air Station. 
because of the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Don Conroy is checked out to deliver atomic weapons, and if that becomes necessary, he's the guy who's going to do it. What happens in between these two years is not just puberty being kind to Pat Conroy, although that's part of it. Uh, we're going to come in a few minutes to something called the Bill Dufford Summer, which Pat wrote about in the cookbook. And that, too, is part of the physical transformation of Pat Conroy between these two years. When the family comes to Beaufort, it's the 23rd time they have moved since Pat has been born. Military brats, military family. Beaufort High School is the 10th school Pat goes to. He's entering the 11th grade. They've moved effectively every single year. He's never been anywhere long enough to forge friendships. He says that nobody remembers him from any school. He's never had a friend. He's never had a girlfriend. No one can remember he was there. No one knows he's left. But now they're coming to Beaufort, and they know they're going to be there for two years because Colonel Conroy's assignment is for at least two years. So Pat knows when he arrives he's going to graduate from Beaufort High that he will actually have time to forge bonds for the first time in his school career. He's never had anything that feels like a hometown. And his mother, Peg, tells him, why don't you make Buford your hometown? Which obviously he did very well. It's here at this school, at Buford High School, where Pat finally blossoms for the first time because he has an opportunity to do that. It's the first public school he's gone to. Everything else. until this point has been a Catholic school. And because Beaufort is a military town with the air station, Paris Island, the Naval Hospital, this school is particularly welcoming military brats. It's accustomed to having new kids come in from military families. And Pat finds friends. He finds opportunities there that he's never had before. And this school really creates Pat Conroy as we come to know. It makes Pat Conroy possible. At Beaufort High, he becomes a standout athlete on the basketball team. Point guard, same position he'll play at the Citadel. He is voted in his senior year, best all around, Mr. Congeniality. He is class president. He is the making. He is the MVP and captain of that basketball team. All of that happens because Buford High is so welcoming to Pat. And he finally finds the opportunity to figure out who he's going to be. He has a remarkable high school experience. And he starts making friends, and not all friendships end happily for Pat. He learns more about tragedy as well. This is Randy Randall, one of Pat's best friends. And if you know this story, because of The Water is Water, the Pat Conroy cookbook, you know that Randy dies on the pitcher's mound during the school baseball game. He has an aneurysm, drops dead on the mound in front of the whole school. This is Pat's best friend. Randy is the son of the school superintendent, Morgan Randall. So it's particularly tragic for the school, for the whole town. And the loss of Pat's friend, Randy, inspires him to write what he always described as his first poem. And I think what he meant by that is it's the first poem he shared with anyone. I suspect he was writing privately for himself before that. But he writes a poem about Randy Randall, uh, specifically to give to Morgan and to Julia, Randy's parents. And this is it. <clears throat> to Randy Randall. I have ceased to wonder at the rapid flight of days. A slice of birds and winter shout are but an effort meant to render nature praise. Myself, I wish to think about a hundred friends who walk a pathless street alone in search of loss and youth grieve dreams. Once a boy, fluid limbed and not quite fully grown, gave love to life, and life, it seemed, surfeited the honey tooth of perfect joy. Yet darkness lit another place far off in the hills. So shadow wrapped the boy in death and pressed his guiltless face into the flawless pages of eternal rhyme, a snow-fleeced lamb of earth and God-bound child of time. It's Pat at 16 years old. He's mimicking Thomas Wolfe, but he's writing beautifully. I would say he's overwriting, and maybe he is at this point, but everyone starts somewhere. Nobody starts out writing The Prince of Tides. It's not just that Pat is writing this poem for Randy's parents. He's also writing poems for publication and short stories as well, because Buford High has a literary magazine, The Breakers. And in his first year, 
his uh, junior year at his writing for breakers. In his senior year, his second year at the school, he's become a section editor for Breakers Magazine. So at the age of 17 or 18 years old, Pat Conroy has already decided he's going to be a writer who helps other writers, which is the arc of the entire rest of his life. You might be interested to know that of these five students, these section editors, it's not just Pat who goes on to have a literary career. Three of them do. So even in this small cohort of friends, Pat is already finding other people who are also going to have literary careers. Next to Pat is Julie Zakowski, who becomes Beaufort County's librarian for years and years. In the middle there is Stephanie Edwards, who teaches Ollie classes. Some of you may have met her in that context. She's a novelist and writing teacher as well, returning to Beaufort after a long career in New York theater. So three of these kids go on to have literary careers. Well, just to give you another short sample of Pat's poetry at a very young age, this is one of the pieces he writes for Breakers. Also a poem written about the same time as the Randy Randall poem. It has much of the same tone as that, and it's called An Atheist's <coughs> Repent. And this is from the latter part of it. The fragrant earth bids welcome to me and excites my passionate bliss. A voice called reason speaks quietly. Only God could make such as this. With this, the heavens in anger arrayed spits down upon my trite disbelief. The rain from above me cascades. My soul exalts, freed from its grief. I bow my head in humble shame and pray to him I have not known. My dry tongue utters just his name. Having found God, I walk slowly home. So he's experimenting. He's learning his craft, writing beautiful pieces early on. Not as sophisticated as what he will write later, but he's learning. And he's being read because he's being published, and that means everything to a young writer. This is also Buford High, where Pat meets many of the teachers who will shape his life, who give him a different model for adulthood than what he has seen from his parents. And that's important to a boy at this age, who's trying to figure out what kind of man he's going to be. Jean Norris, his junior year English teacher and psychology teacher. Millen Ellis, senior year English. Anne Head, first creative writing teacher Pat Conroy will ever have. Grace Dennis, his homeroom teacher, who would have been his typing teacher had his father allowed him to take typing, which he did not. <laughs> Even the school secretary, Norma Duncan, who was just a couple of years older than Pat, became like a surrogate sibling to him. Bill Dufford, school principal, and the school librarian, wonderful character, Miss Eileen Hunter. We're going to talk about a few of these people in more depth. And we've got to start with Jean Norris, who was such a central figure in Pat's life. This is what Pat wrote about Jean in The Water is Why. Jean Norris dwelt in Beaufort as the prophet before the storm, an intense, bespeckled man who preached love for all humanity at a time when it was physically dangerous to do so. He reigned as the village eight ball, the left arm, the joker in the pile, the odd number in our even-numbered world. Jean inspires the English teacher character Ogden Loring in The Great Santini, who described himself beautifully this way, I am a man of strange parts. And I think that captured Jean quite well. Although he was an English teacher by training, by vocation, he had a very uh, multidisciplinary approach to doing that. Jean believed in bringing music into the classroom, classical music, something Pat would later do himself on Defusky Island believed in the value of field trips, and we'll talk about one of those in particular in just a second here. So Pat was learning not just the subject of English, but the art of teaching from Jean. And he wrote about that as well. Jean here, quite possibly Pat, kind of looks like him from the back there. And this is what Pat said about Jean as teacher. His eloquence was so understated that it was almost unnoticeable. He displayed a complete assurance in the composure and ease he brought to the art of teaching. At the end of the first day, I was impressed with the man. By the end of the first week, I was in love with him. He taught his students a language that was fragrant with beauty, treacherous with loss, comfortable with madness and despair, and a catchword for love itself. You will notice as we go through a few of these quotes from Pat about teaching, he cannot talk about teaching without also talking about love. They are intertwined ideas for Pat. You will see that word quite a bit. Well, I mentioned field trips. Early on, Jean recognized in Pat that this was a special kid. 
Pat's teachers didn't know that he was being beaten at home. None of the teachers really recognized that the Conroys were being victims of abuse uh, from the father's perspective. But they could see that they were looking for something at school that they weren't getting at home. And Jean, in particular, recognized this and realized early on that Pat wanted to be a writer, that this was something Pat was struggling toward. So as an effort to help him on that path, after a basketball game in Charleston, Jean took Pat north rather than south, and they went to see this man. Anybody know who that is? Well, you're about to. <laughs> this is Archibald Rutledge, South Carolina's first poet laureate. In simplest terms to explain who Rutledge is, let me put it this way. He was Pat Conroy before there was a Pat Conroy. Archibald Rutledge was the most widely respected, most published writer of his time, before Pat. He wrote short stories for what at the time were called boys' magazines. He was writing adventure stories about hunting and fishing in the woods, memoirs, um, and a lot of poetry. He would have said, first and foremost, he was a poet, but there's no money in poetry, so he was publishing short stories and teaching instead. He lived at Hampton Plantation, which is now a state park near McClellansville, his ancestral home. And that day, uh, Gene brought Pat to see Archibald Rutledge, this incredible, uh, famous poet. Pat didn't know they were going there, and he was surprised when he found out where they were going. And Archibald Rutledge, who certainly did not have to spend time with any kid from anywhere, spent the entire day with Pat Conroy. They walked the grounds of Hampton Plantation together. <coughs> Rutledge explained to Pat the proper names for flora and fauna. He showed him how to recognize markings of animals. He told him the story of Francis Marion, the swamp fox, when he passed through Hampton Plantation during the American Revolution. Rutledge took Pat into his writing room, where he was working on a poem. And he showed Pat, who was 16 years old at the time, perhaps, this poem in progress. And he said, young man, what would you do to make this poem better? Imagine that, a famous writer asking a kid, what would you do to make my writing better? Pat was blown away by that. And he suggested making a stronger final line. And Mr. Rutledge said, thank you. I'll take that under consideration. I'd love to know if he did. I would love to know if there was a poem that was co-written by Archibald Rutledge and Pat Conroy, because that would be an incredible find. Afterwards, uh, Jean and Pat get in the car for the long drive back to Buford, and Jean asks Pat what he learned that day. And Pat talks about this in My Reading Life, and I want to play a bit of that from for you. Let's see, I think we're going to have to switch screens for just a second here. Like Archibald Rutledge. I admitted that I was unprepared to meet such an important man and could hardly believe that he had spent so much time with me and seemed so unhurried as he answered my foolish, boyish questions. I told Jean that Archibald Rutledge had told me about the definitive value of details. Then I described the path where Francis Marion had escaped the British cavalry patrol. I spoke of camellia bushes 10 feet high and the color of ink Mr. Rutledge used to write his poems, and his ancestors had built a plantation in 1735. You didn't learn the most important thing, Jean said. I thought there was more to you, substance, that kind of thing. I gave you credit for having a substance you don't have. What are you talking about? Here's what you should have learned, but you didn't. Now you know how to treat a young boy or girl who wants to be a writer. If, by a miracle, you become a writer, Archibald Rutledge just showed you how a famous writer treats a no-account 16-year-old boy who's got the same dreams he did as a kid. If I ever get to be a writer, Mr. Norris, I'll be nice to every kid I meet. That's a promise. It was a throwaway pledge I made in the giddiness of having just met a working poet for the first time. But Jean Norris would never let me forget it. Over the years, when a resourceful high school student was writing a report on one of my books, Mr. Norris became the primary source for getting in touch with me. He threw that day at Hampton Plantation and my visit with Archibald Rutledge in my face for the rest of his life. 
Norris, Norris, please listen to me. I would whine. I've got books to write. I've got kids in college. When will my debt to you be stamped, paid in full? <laughs> this little girl from Lawrence, 17, a lovely darling girl, bright as a penny made in Denver. She's doing a paper on the Prince of Tides. I told her you'd call her tomorrow night. You can't do this, Gene. You just can't do it. I seem to remember a 16-year-old boy. He was in my class over 30 years ago. He sure would have liked to talk to a real writer. It seems I took him to meet a Mr. Archibald Rutledge, who was sure nice to that snot-nosed boy. <laughs> What's the damn telephone number, Norris? <laughs> so over the years, I would call the girl in Lawrence, or the sweetheart of a boy from Prosperity, or the cheerleader from Spartanburg, or the drum major from Conway. South Carolina is a state of contained, unshared intimacies. It is a state of cross currents, passwords, secret handshakes, but it rewards the lifelong curiosity of both natives and strangers alike. When I called an honor student in Orangeburg, I would touch down the lives of 50 families who loved that child and every English class in that high school. I never called a kid who found me through the good offices of Jean Norris, who was not scrupulously prepared, inquisitive, and nimble-footed. Their questions were so refined I couldn't get off the phone in less than an hour. Some of them confessed that my great English teacher had spent several phone calls making sure that they were all well equipped for their interviews with me. All of them were appreciative and grateful for my time, but I could tell that every one of them was nuts over Gene Norris. So that gives us a little insight into Pat and Gene, which I particularly enjoy about that clip. I also like that Pat does a little voice acting. He does Gene's accent pretty well. He can't sustain it. He doesn't do it for the whole clip, but he does a little bit of it, which is nice. Well, Pat and Gene, as that audio clip implies, were in touch long after Pat left Buford High School. They had a lifelong friendship, so much so that Pat was the executor of Gene's estate. This is them, all suited up at an award ceremony. But it's not an award for Pat. This is Gene getting a Lifetime Achievement Award from South Carolina's Teacher Association. Uh, there's Pat in his suspenders phase uh, with Gene, and another man we'll get to in just a second. They're in Barbara Streisand's apartment after the film premiere of The Prince of Tides. That's how important Gene was to Pat. He wanted him there for events like that as well. Our third man, sort of faded in the corner there, is this guy, Bill Dufford. Pat's high school principal. And Pat wrote quite a bit about Dufford, probably more than he wrote about Gene Norris. Here's a couple of quotes, the first from the Pat Conroy cookbook. Bill Dufford occupies a place of highest honor among the teachers who found me directionless and yearning to become a person of consequence as I stumbled through my childhood. And then uh, from A Low Country Heart, from the essay entitled The Summer I Met My First Great Man. I was in the middle of a childhood being raised by a father I didn't admire. In a desperate way, I needed the guidance of someone who could show me another way of becoming a man. It was sometime during that year when I decided I would become the kind of man that Bill Dufford was born to be. I wanted to be the type of man that a whole town could respect and honor and fall in love with, the way that Buford did when Bill Dufford came to town to teach and shape and turn their children into the best citizens they could be. Well, this summer Pat is referring to in both of these titles is the summer between his junior year and his senior year. His father, Don Conroy, wanted all of the kids to work but not be paid for that. That would be not in keeping with the Marine spirit. So they were expected to volunteer. And Pat volunteered at the school, at the high school, to do odd jobs around the school, painting bookshelves and fences, digging ditches. He did all of this with Bill Dufford, the school principal, who didn't just delegate the work, he did it because Dr. Dufford was a hands-on kind of educator. So they would work together in the mornings. At lunchtime, Bill would take Pat to Harry's restaurant on Bay Street, 
they would have lunch together and talk about the subject of the day. At that particular time, the subject of the day was desegregation. Now remember, Pat had gone to Catholic schools before this. He had had an integrated education. So he was very comfortable with this. Bill Duffer, scion of the Old South, was not, through no fault of his own, he had been raised in an environment of white supremacy. He was still coming around to this idea of inclusion, of togetherness. Pat was already there. So it was particularly important that these two meet each other at this point in their respective lives, about 20 year age difference between them. But the stories that young Pat tells Bill Dufford about what it's like to go to an integrated school affect Bill. They make him a little more open to the idea than he would have been otherwise. And as we follow the full arc of Bill's career, you'll see just how, what kind of an impact that meeting young Pat Conroy has on him. It's not just one way, it's both. Well, in the afternoon, after these lunches at Harry's, they would go back to the school and Pat would get what was effectively his payment, and that was unrestricted access to the gym to practice his basketball game by himself. So Pat would invent, invent these elaborate games in which he was always the hero, always landing the right shot at the right time, effectively writing short stories in his imagination, even as a young boy. So that Dufford summer was very important to Pat on a number of levels. But more than anything else, it showed him a model of adulthood in Bill Dufford that was rooted in generosity and service and kindness and love, very different from his father. It also showed him another model of being a teacher, something that Pat is already thinking about. And here's what he writes about that, first from The Water is Wide. To Bill Dufford, education was as holy a profession as the priesthood. It was one of the greatest gifts that he could convey his sense of mission about education to the kids who came under his jurisdiction. A whole tribe of us went into teaching because of his influence. And then at a 1995 address at USC to a group of education students, we had Bill Dufford in the audience, Pat said this. When you went to Bill Dufford's school, the one thing you knew was that you were one of his kids and that you had a responsibility to your school because it was your community, your part of the world. I never saw anyone get this across better. And I went into teaching because of Bill Dufford, because he had convinced me that there was no way a human being could live upon this earth and do anything better than to teach young people. It affected me, and I'm simply one of hundreds who it affected. And that's probably quantifiably true. Over the course of Bill Dufford's teaching career, I bet a hundred of his kids went into teaching. I've met many of them. He was simply that kind of role model. And Pat was so moved by Dr. Dufford. Anytime you encounter a principal in any of Pat's novels, it's Dufford every single time. There's a principal in The Great Santini, that's Bill Dufford. There's a principal in The Prince of Tides, that's Bill Dufford. In the book that he was writing when he passed away, Pat mentions a high school principal named Bill Wofford. Guess who that is? It's Bill Dufford. It's always going to be Bill Dufford. Well, when Pat goes to the Citadel, Bill Dufford goes back to school too. He goes to the University of Florida where he gets his doctorate in education, studying under some of the most incredible experts in education, not just in the country, but in the world, people with a global view of education. And it's there that he continues his transformation from Old South to New South ideas, and he comes out of that experience, comes back to South Carolina, and becomes one of the central but largely unsung figures in successful school desegregation. And this photo here, he's in Sumter, South Carolina, with Dr. Earl Vaughn. They are successfully integrating the high school there, which they do in the course of about a year and a half. Comes such a good model that the New York Times writes a story on this, and Dr. Duffert and a group of students, black and white, are invited to go to Alabama to show those kids, from the students' perspective, how integration, how desegregation works. Dr. Duffert does this at a number of schools. And to this day, 93 years old, he is still actively involved in education in Newberry, South Carolina. There is a Dufford Diversity Institute at Newberry Opera House where they teach diversity education to third and fourth graders. And every year, Dufford, uh, excuse me, Newberry College has a Dufford Diversity and Inclusion Week where they teach these ideas to college students. Well, here's Pat, obviously, and Dr. Dufford, and they're in an award ceremony too. But as with Gene Norris, this is not an award for Pat. This is for Bill Dufford. 
South Carolina Governor's Award in the Humanities, an award Pat had already received. When Dr. Dufford won it, Pat was there to introduce him and share that moment with him because it meant so much to him. Here they are a little bit before that. Pat in the middle here, obviously. Bill Dufford, Gene Norris. That's Julie Zakowski, who we saw earlier, uh, that Beaufort County librarian I mentioned. So when Pat forged a bond with one of these teacher mentors, he sustained it over a lifetime. It extended long beyond the classroom. Our story needs a woman. I've got a hell of a woman to introduce you to. This is Ann Head, pen name of Ann Morris, who was born Ann Wales Christensen. Christensen's uh, an old family in Buford. She was a published novelist when Pat was a high school student, a rising star in Southern literature. Some of her books were Fair with Rain, Always in August, Everybody Adored Kara, and Mr. and Mrs. Bojo Jones, which was made into a movie starring Desi Arnaz Jr. So her star was very much on the rise, and Jean Norris recruited her as a volunteer to be the first creative writing teacher at Buford High School. It's not in a yearbook, she's never on a payroll. She did it as volunteer service to the community. And where Jean Norris and Bill Dufford and so many of Pat's teachers were warm and embracing, that really wasn't how Anne Head lived her life. Here's what Pat wrote about her in the cookbook. On first sight, Mrs. Morris projected a steely withholding, an icy reserve that would have been off-putting to me, except for the thrilling fact she was the first novelist I'd ever met in the flesh. She looked like a woman who would not tolerate a preposition at the end of the sentence or an anarchy of a dangling participle. She is a bit cold and off-putting to Pat. She's serious, she's a fantastic writer, and turns out to be a remarkable teacher, but she's not the warm embrace that so many of Pat's other teachers were. But she does a couple of things for Pat that are incredibly important to his, to his uh, burgeoning interest in being a writer. Because she is being published at that time in New York, she's not only teaching these kids about writing, she's teaching them about publishing. She's sharing letters from her agent and her editor. She's talking about the film deal that will eventually come to fruition for Mr. and Mrs. Bojo Jones. She's giving them an education in the business of literature, not just the craft of literature. Well, Pat is one of about eight students who are taking this creative writing class, and his father finds out about it. And Colonel Conroy wants Pat to become a fighter pilot like his dad, and he can't think of anything more useless than a creative writing class. So he forbids Pat from taking the creative writing class. But by this point, Ann Head has already discovered what a raw talent Pat has, and they strike a deal that Pat will continue to take the class and he just won't be listed on the roster. So he takes this class in defiance of his father, which becomes part of Pat's whole life. That's where it begins. Well, he learns a bit more about Miss Morris after he graduates because they become sort of pen pals of sorts. When Pat goes to the Citadel, he's writing there short stories and poetry, and he's sending that back to Mrs. Morris, and she is writing critiques for him. She is responding favorably to things that Pat is writing in college. And frankly, that's not easy, because here's uh, Pat at the Citadel, and here's what he described as the most famous poem in the history of the Citadel, written his freshman year and published in the literary magazine, Four Lines. The dreams of youth are pleasant dreams, of women, vintage, and the sea. Last night I dreamt I was a dog who found an upperclassman tree. <laughs> I got the beating of his life for publishing this poem. But he gives this uh, to Will McLean, the autobiographical character based on Pat who appears in The Lords of Discipline. This poem appears later in one of Pat's novels. And he gives Will uh, an even braver second uh, set of lines, which I won't read in full, but I will tell you simply that the central line in the continuation of the poem is between the words species and feces. So it gets worse. But this is what he sends back to Mrs. Morris, and she is very supportive of that, which he needs. A published novelist is telling him that he might be good enough to do what she does. That's incredibly empowering to a young writer. I've been able to show you photos of Pat with Gene Norris later in life and Pat with Bill Dufford later in life. No photo of Pat with Mrs. M later in life because she passes away 
two years after Pat graduates from the Citadel. And here's what he wrote about that, also in the cookbook. At the time of her death, Mrs. M was the only writer I actually knew by sight, and her untimely and unforeseen death robbed me of a mentor I thought would help me navigate the fearful world of American publishing. I was lucky that she found me as a boy, and whenever I publish a new book, I take a rose to her headstone and place it before her without a word, respecting her detachment as part of the bond between us. It's beautiful. Well, I'm going to give you one more woman from Pat's uh, Buford High School experience, and it's one of my favorite figures in his life, Eileen Hunter, school librarian. Here's what Pat wrote about her in my reading life. Among librarians, I was popular in every town I landed in until I got to Beaufort, South Carolina. Then Eileen Hunter stormed into my life. Now, we've talked about how popular Pat was in high school, but he didn't show up as the popular kid. He became that over the course of that first year, his junior year. When he showed up, he was still shy and awkward. And what he would do at Catholic schools when he felt overwhelmed was retreat into the church. But now he's at a public school. There is no church. But there is a place at public school, the Buford High School, that feels holy and sacred to Pat, and it's the library. So he retreats into the library at lunchtime because he doesn't know anyone. He has no one to sit to sit with, rather. And that's where Miss Hunter encounters him for the first time, reading Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. And I want to share again an audio clip with you. Uh, this is also from my reading life. And as with last time, this is Pat's voice you're going to hear. Let's see if we can get it going. After Christmas of my... Let's see. Come on. In the halls of Beaver High School, I'd heard rumors of Miss Hunter. She was famous among both teachers and students for her legendary temper and her need for absolute control of her book line fiefdom. Among students, the mere mention of her name inspired a sense of terror. She was known to be allergic to juicy fruit chewing gum, which inspired a certain breed of mischievous boy to plant logs of gum under tables and chairs throughout the library. If the chewed gum was fresh enough, Miss Hunter could be watched sprinting toward the teacher's lounge, where she would vomit in the sink. Trained as a teacher of home economics, she found herself recruited to be a librarian when there was a surprise resignation in the middle of the school year. When I encountered her wrathful gaze, she had served as a librarian for more than 20 years. Her disposition was troll-like, and her demeanor combative. She seemed agitated every time a student disturbed the airspace of her private domain. When she spotted me reading Hugo, she reacted as though I'd taken a box of Crayolas to the Book of Kells. What on earth are you doing here? She said. I'm reading a book, ma'am, I said. In my high school years, I was polite to the point of being oleogenous. I can see that. Do I look like an idiot or something? Miss Hunter stamped. It's against the rules for a student to use the library during lunchtime. Sorry, ma'am, I didn't know that, I replied. What's that book you're reading? She grabbed it out of my hand and examined it as though it were pornographic contraband. She studied the book then eyed me with a ferocious scowl. This book's never even been checked out. Are you reading it for the dirty parts? She asked, <laughs> as though she had cracked the mystery of the strange encounter. I didn't know it had dirty parts, I answered. If it does, I'll toss it with the morning trash. If you find anything dirty, report it directly to me. Hugo's a Frenchman. I don't like his books. Do you know what I hear about this Hugo guy? No, ma'am. His character, she said, studying the cover of the book. He's depressing. All the folks he writes about are just so, just so miserable. We've got another one of his books. You ought to try that. It's about a football team. Do you like football? Yes, ma'am. Eileen Hunter seemed pleased at my answer and pulled another volume of Victor Hugo from a shelf. Then she handed me a copy of The Hunchback of Notre Dame for my reading pleasure. Though she never demonstrated a shred of affection for me, 
I heard from other teachers that Miss Hunter thought highly of me and always admired my passion for French literature. <laughs> Checking a book out of the Buford High School Library required a swashbuckling, adventurous spirit <laughs> as Miss Hunter patrolled those aisles with the austerity of a knight errant. Whenever she checked out a book, she treated the poor student as she would a visiting pirate. For Miss Hunter, I think that the state of Nirvana would be a library cleaned of all readers and the books all shelved and accounted for. As a librarian, she was legendary in all the wrong ways and for all the wrong reasons. When I returned to teach at Buford High School after my graduation from the Citadel, I encountered Miss Hunter again, but this time as a teaching colleague. She was as cranky and adversarial as ever and would light into me with her complaints as I would bring four or five novels to check out for my weekly reading. I don't think teachers should be allowed to check books out of the library, she said. <laughs> Pray tell why, Miss Hunter. You're just taking a book out of circulation that a student might be reading. She harumphed. She was a world-class harumpher. They're all virgins, I checked. None have ever been checked out before, I told her. How dare you bring up the subject of sex in my library? I only do it to excite you, Miss Hunter. Everyone has noticed your incredible sexual attraction to me. It's a talk of the faculty lounge. You repulse me in every fiber of my being. So you say, Eileen, I said, leaning toward her, but I've read the secrets of your dark, disgusting heart. I know what you're really after. I'm calling Sheriff Wallace, she said. He'll shackle you like a dog and drag you behind his patrol car. Till our next forbidden encounter, Eileen. I didn't give you permission to call me by my Christian name. Eileen, 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 I said as I sailed out to my first period class. So that's pretty far removed from the kinds of experience Pat has with his other teachers and the kinds of experiences he and his mother have had with public libraries. It's sort of uh, the exception that proves the rule, I think. Well, as Pat mentions in that audio clip, after he graduates the Citadel, he comes back to Buford High School. Many of his more casual fans assume that Pat leaves the Citadel and goes immediately to Defusky Island. But there are two years in between where Pat is teaching at Buford High School, uh, teaching alongside many of the people who had been his teachers, including Ms. Hunter. And while they don't have a friendship, certainly, they do have a kind of relationship, because Eileen Hunter had a fairly elevated view of her standing in the community. And she thought there were places she could go, and there were places that she couldn't go as school librarian. And she would get what she referred to as summer colds, getting them her whole life, apparently. And the only cure for a summer cold, in Ms. Hunter's estimation, was a hot toddy. And the only way to make a hot toddy <coughs> of course, with alcohol, but she wasn't going to go to the liquor store, so she got Pat to go for her. <laughs> but she didn't want to be seen receiving the brown bag, of course, so their arrangement was that Pat would leave it in a milk crate on her doorstep, and she would leave money for him there, so there's no human interaction in the course of this transaction. And that's what they did during the two years that Pat was at Buford High School as a teacher. That was the extent of his relationship with Ms. Hunter. Well, he goes back to her library, to that Buford High School library, one more time. Uh, when he is fired from teaching on Defusky Island, he sues for wrongful termination, and he wants the Teachers Association on his side, as naturally you would. So the association meets in that school library, in Ms. Hunter's library, and Pat gives an impassioned speech about his wrongful termination. And there is nearly unanimous support. The Teachers Association does support him in that trial. Ultimately, he loses the trial, but the Teachers Association is on his side. With the exception of 18 teachers, 18 hands go up in protest when there's a vote. They're all teachers from Buford High School, teachers who had either been Pat's teachers when he was a student there, or teaching colleagues when he got there. And one of the hands belonged to Ms. Hunter. And even as odd as their relationship was, that was still heartbreaking to Pat that she wouldn't support him in the trial. Here's how he ends the essay about her in My Reading Life. 
I was born to be in a library, and there wasn't a thing she could do to intimidate me or run me out. I think I was as, as fond of Eileen Hunter as anyone she ever met, and I believe she knew that. I'll always believe she knew what was in my heart. This photo we're looking at is a yearbook photo, of course. It's actually from Gene Norris's yearbook of what was Pat's junior year, the year he met Miss Hunter. But I also have Pat's yearbook from that same year, and Miss Hunter signed it this way. So given how their relationship ends, it is fascinating for me to discover there was never a moment when she could write, love Miss Hunter, in fact, on her yearbook. Here's what Pat said about his English teachers and teachers in general in um, A Low Country Heart, in a letter to the editor to the Charleston Gazette, which has been uh, reprinted a number of places. My English teachers pushed me to be smart and inquisitive, and they taught me the great books of the world with passion and cunning and love. There's that word again. They lived in the bright fires of their imaginations, and they taught because they were born to teach the prettiest language in the world. I have yet to meet an English teacher who assigned a book to damage a kid. They take an unutterable joy in opening up the known world to their students. Well, it's probably not surprising that Pat was so moved by the positive influences of his teachers that he himself becomes a teacher after he graduates from the Citadel. As I mentioned, comes back to Buford High. He teaches there for two years, 1967 to 1969 school years. And you might think that Pat Conroy, the writer, is probably an English teacher, right? Not so. Pat taught psychology. Let that sink in for a minute. Mm -hmm. And in 1968, the second year Pat was at Buford High, was the year that that school integrated. And Pat was the faculty advisor to the African-American students. And he created, at Buford High School, the first Afro-American Afro history class in any public school in the state of South Carolina. He was only allowed to teach it if white students would sign up for the class. And I would love to know if that was thrown in his path under the assumption that white students would not sign up for it, therefore there would be no class, or if there was another thinking to it. But ultimately it didn't matter because students who took Pat's psychology class the year before signed up for his African American studies class because Pat had been such a remarkable teacher. They were so moved for that. Pat, as I mentioned much earlier, was writing in his unpublished final novel, Storms of Aquarius, about what it was like to be a first-year teacher. He hadn't published very much about teaching at Buford High, but he published a little. And uh, this is a piece I particularly enjoy from a low country heart. I consider the two years at Buford when I, was, when I taught high school as perhaps the happiest time of my life. My attraction to melodrama and suffering had not yet overwhelmed me, but signs were surfacing. No one had warned me that a teacher could fall so completely in love with his students that graduation seemed like the death of a small civilization. Beautiful line, isn't it? Question. Yes, ma'am. Why was he fired? Why was he fired? We're going to get to that. Okay. Stick with me. I'm going to yeah. get you there. I promise. A couple of Pat's psychology students gave us uh, handwritten version of his field trip rules from the time he took those kids to the uh, state mental health hospital. And I'll read a few of these for you because they'll give you insight into what Pat was like as a teacher. Pat Conroy's stringent, uncompromising rules for his psychology class trip. Number one, there will be no rebellion against authority engendered by any real or imaginary generation gap. Two, let there be no drinking, debauching, sinning, and or calling beloved psychology teacher names to be found on bathroom walls. Three, young maidens will guard themselves in modesty. Prison riots induced by girls wolf whistling at prisoners will adversely affect your grade. Young gentlemen, and I use the word gentlemen in the loosest connotation, will use a spoon when they eat their soup at lunch. And this, my favorite. If you irritate or exacerbate your most esteemed psychology teacher while on trip, here's how to calculate grade for the semester. <laughs> Take the number 1,000, then add 4,000, divide by 5,000, then subtract the board. <laughs> Two of Pat's uh, students, Celeste Prince-Brown and Connie Hip, 
donated a handwritten version of this to the Conroy Center, and they kept it all those years, not because Pat became a famous writer, but because he had been such a fantastic teacher. And I've talked to a few of uh, Pat's other psychology students who also kept a lot from Pat's class, again, because of what a remarkable teacher he was. <coughs> Well, we get a little more insight into what Pat was like as a teacher by hearing from some of those students. And I want to focus on this one in particular. This is Vanessa Valerie Sayers. Val, Valerie. She was the daughter of a civilian psychologist from Paris Island taking Pat's psychology class. So her father did for his career the thing that Pat was learning to teach. She should have been Pat's toughest critic. And here's what she wrote in an unpublished essay about what Pat was like as a teacher. We must have called him Mr. Conroy, but that's hard to imagine. Outside class, if we thought we were cool, we referred to him as Pat. When we gossiped, we called him Pat Conroy, one word on one breath, a movie star's name. When he paced our high school psychology classroom, he was all performer, good looking in a Paul Newman, cool hand Luke kind of way, only taller, younger, cooler. He was a master of the sudden pause, the beat, the punchline. He told us funny, self-deprecating stories, spears, his gaffes, and we didn't believe a word. Two years out of the Citadel, he was only six or seven years older than we were, but he was Robert Kennedy, Wilt Chamberlain, and the Beatles rolled into one. So that gives you a little glimpse into what Pat was like as a teacher. Well, that's Valerie then. This is Valerie now. Anybody know who this is? Anybody know where I'm going? A few of you do. Oh, yes, I've given you the benefit of a handout. <laughs> yes. Uh, Valerie wrote a novel called Due East, which is set in a fictional version of Beaufort, South Carolina. Then she wrote five other novels, many of them also set in that fictional town of Due East. She's an endowed professor of English at the University of Notre Dame, two-time Pushcart Prize recipient for short fiction, and in April, she'll be inducted into South Carolina's Academy of Authors, which is our state's literary hall of fame. Pat, her teacher, was inducted in 1988, so she'll join Pat as only the second writer from Beaufort, South Carolina, ever to be inducted into that hall of fame. Two of her books were adapted into a film, Due East, with Robert Forrester, Kate Capshaw, and Sybil Shepard. So if you think about that trajectory from Anne Head, novelist, to Pat Conroy, novelist, then to Valerie Sayers, novelist, who is now a teacher of novelists herself, it's pretty remarkable, going backwards and forwards across time. And yes, uh, I did give you a little hint as to who Valerie was, because some of these flyers are around the room, and there's a stack of them up front here as well. In April, we are inducting Valerie into the Hall of Fame, as I mentioned. Uh, in Beaufort, first time the ceremony's ever been held in Beaufort. And it's worthy of note, given our subject, that the three living writers all have connections to Pat Conroy. Natalie Dupree was one of Pat's teachers, his first cooking teacher in Atlanta. New York Times bestseller Mary Alice Monroe in the middle there was mentored by Pat. He was a great influence in her, but not only as a novelist, but as a conservationist as well. So all three of the living inductees are connected to Pat in their way. Now we're going to Dehusky Island. Because after those two years at Buford High School, we're now to 1969, which is the year of integration at Dehusky Island, the Mary Field School there, a little two-room school. Pat goes out there. Not only is he the first white teacher on Dehusky Island, he is the first male teacher. These kids have never had a male teacher before either. He is teaching grades five through eight, 18 students in all. Pat has had absolutely zero training teaching students in this age group. But he wants to do this. This is important to him. I want to share with you another video clip. Uh, this is from the Pat Conroy at 70 uh, Festival, which we held in view for Pat's 70th birthday. We were having a panel of authors and artists talking about Pat, and there was an empty chair on stage because one of the artists couldn't come, and we just forgot to remove the chair. So it was up there by itself. And Pat was in the audience. He was in the audience most of the festival when he wasn't on stage. But at that point, because of the empty chair, one of the writers on stage said, Pat, why don't you come on up? We've saved a chair for you. And he gave into peer pressure, and he went up there. And I mention all of that because this moment wasn't supposed to happen. What you're about to see was not supposed to happen. Pat wasn't supposed to be on stage. 
He wasn't supposed to be asked the question that he was asked, and he wasn't supposed to give his answer. So it's remarkable that we recorded this at all. The question asked of the other panelists was, which Pat Conroy book is closest to your heart? Not which is your favorite Pat Conroy book, not which do you read the most often or anything else. <coughs> which is closest to your heart? <coughs> and in the clip I'm about to show you, Pat is asked that question as well. Which of your books is closest to your heart? It takes him a second to remember to use the microphone, so you're not going to be able to hear the first part of this, but be patient, because you'll figure it out. Conroy, work closest to your heart. You know, this has been, it was a book I'm ashamed of for a long time. Here. I didn't think it was very well written. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> It was a book I was ashamed of for a long time because I didn't think I'd written it very well. I didn't think I'd taken the time for it, but recently, the book that has meant the most to me is The Water is Wild. And, and, and I was trying to figure out why. And it was, in you know, Jonathan's sitting there, and Jonathan is one of the reasons it is so. And, I worry constantly. When I went over to that island, it was the first year of teacher in a great, in the history of this state. I learned later the kids that I taught, the 18 kids I taught, were not told a white boy was coming over there. They see me standing there the first day, they're terrified. They're scared to death. They told me, you know, these parents, I could be a Klansman. You know, coming over there, and you know, I could hurt them. And the parents were worried about me hurting them. Then the first couple of days, okay, um, I hate testing, but I was required to give tests to these kids. They're all read below the first grade level. Um, they didn't seem to have IQs. They did not, I had six of them didn't know the alphabet. I had, and I'm teaching fifth through eighth grade, and I had been told we had separate but equal schools in the South. So that night, I write and say to the superintendent of schools, that is the biggest lie that has ever been told. And I've been out here, and some of these kids don't know anything. And I told the kids I had to press them with these tests. And so I gathered the kids together at the end of that first week, and I said, OK, kids, we've got a lot of work to do. But let's have a ball doing it. Let's have fun doing it. I was 23 years old. I didn't know what I was doing about anything. But I said, here's what I think. They sent you the right guy. <laughs> and I don't really have any idea why I thought that at that age. But now that I'm 70, I look back on that is the magic year when I discovered the man. I was meant to be. You can hear him being choked up as he yeah. says it, too. I think what's so important about that moment is that the year Pat is describing is not a year of writing. As a man of 70, looking back on his entire life, He's looking at a year of teaching as the year that defined who he was. <clears throat> at the center, we have a handwritten copy of another letter Pat wrote that first night, a letter he wrote to his parents, and he realized really what he was getting into on Defusquion. And I'm going to read you from the, uh, the transcript of that. A lot of this actually made it word for word into The Water is Wide, so if you've read that, you may recognize some of this passage. The first day of school has ended, and I'm still reeling from the emotional impact of facing a seemingly hopeless situation, eye to eye. Nothing could have prepared me for this. Most of the kids are functionally illiterate. They cannot read, write, speak, or communicate in any way. I gave them several assignments. One boy could only scratch out his name. That was the limit of his ability. Many of them stare at me with dull, unimaginative faces that reflect total confusion. Others, however, convey with grins and mischievous faces and native intelligence I hope to capitalize upon. There is a map of the world hanging up on the wall. I asked if anyone could pinpoint to Fusky Island for me on the map. About eight hands immediately shot up. The first girl walked up and without hesitation put her pencil 
in an isolated spot in outer Mongolia. The next boy pinpointed Pakistan, the next Rhodesia, and the next a place in Russia near the Bering Strait. I then shifted my tactics, oh crafty teacher, and asked in what country the Fusky Island was located. A hand shot up, South Carolina. No, I mean what country? South Carolina is only a state. Silence ensued as all minds reflected on, on the imponderable. I finally coaxed America out of one shy lad. Other tidbits would prove interesting. Since Savannah is the only large city they have ever visited, it is in their minds the largest city in the world, bigger by far than New York or Washington. The universe has been limited to very few experiences. Mother, when and if you come, I would be prone at this moment to put you to work on remedial reading instead of anything that has to do with my personal comfort on this island. The county, incidentally, came through with a boat, 17 and a half foot outboard. That is more than adequate. The lady for whom I was renting a house died Thursday before I arrived. Hence, because of legal entanglements, I am homeless. Dad, bless your Bishop Street soul for the far-sighted purchase of the sleeping bag and air mattress. My first night on the floor of my classroom would have been intolerable without it. So that's the world Pat steps into. And many people would have just given up at that point. Perhaps they were hoping that's what Pat would do. But he didn't. He committed himself fully to those kids, using the good models of Gene Norris and Bill Dufford. He brought music into the classroom, and poetry and language, and <coughs> visitors, including his sister Carol, the poet, and Tim Belt, the concert pianist. He brought culture to the island that had never been there before. And the reverse. He took those kids off the island. They had no concept of how big the world was. He took them to Beaufort, where they went trick-or-treating. Completely foreign idea to them, and they loved it. <coughs> he made arrangements with friends for them to stay overnight. He made very elaborate arrangements to take them to Washington, D.C. These kids who had never, and for the most part, had never been off the island, were suddenly at the nation's capital, learning about the history and the full scope of the American experience that was theirs. And he was doing all this because he recognized that these kids were not going to have the lives that their parents were, that the Fusky Island was not going to be able to continue in the kind of lifestyle that it had been. Pollution from Savannah was ruining the oyster beds. These kids were not going to do the same kind of uh, fishing uh, that their parents had done. Their lives, their future was off the island, and Pat wanted to prepare them for that. He did so beautifully. And we're going to talk a bit about the experiences of one student in particular. And it's this young woman right there. Anybody know who that is? Sally Ann Robinson. Sally Ann Robinson. Very good. Got a little video with Pat and Sally Ann to talk about what Pat was like as a teacher on Dufusky. or not, but they let me know I could. They let me know. And the teaching caught up, it, it caught inside me, and I could not help it. And I said, you would tell them, I want you to live good, contributing lives. And our job was to grab kids and set them on fire. And I said, you can feel like this. When you read books, you feel like this when something touches you. And if you read the rest of your life, if you're touched like this the rest of your life, you're a free man or woman the rest of your life. A powerful lesson for any teacher, but for those kids at that time, it was an incredible lesson. 
Four of them went on to become teachers in some sense of that word. And Pat remained close with the, almost all of them as long as he could, but Sally Ann more than the others. She became a licensed nurse. Uh, she's a very accomplished chef. She's now the chef in residence at the resort on Defusky Island. And she gives tours of the island as well. She's the only native islander doing that now. She's the author of two cookbooks. Pat wrote the foreword to the first one that we see here. And he toured with her as well. They went out and did talks together. There was a citywide read that had selected Sally Ann's book because they were interested in Gullah culture. And uh, let's see, where was this? I think this is, some, this is in the Twin Cities, if I remember the story correctly. And Pat went out there with Sally Ann, and they talked in some enormous auditorium in front of hundreds and hundreds of people and signed books forever. And afterwards, they were going to go get dinner together and saw there was a bookstore around the corner. And Sally Ann and Pat have both told me this story. So if it's a lie, it's a lie from both of them. But they say that they went into this store, into this bookstore, and Pat went up to the counter, a young man working there, and he said, excuse me, do you have any books by Pat Conroy? And the, and the desk clerk says, I'm sorry, sir, I don't recognize that name. I don't think that we do at all. And Sally Ann says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you have any books by Sally Ann Robinson? And he says, oh, yes, we've got a whole table full of her books. She's doing a big talk just around the corner. So Pat loved this moment when one of his students' fame eclipsed his own. That's very empowering for a teacher to see your students succeed. Here's a little bit more from The Water is Wide. And we're going to get to the question you asked about why Pat is fired from Defusky Island. Teaching is a record of failures, but the glory of teaching is in the attempt. I dislike poor teachers. They are criminals to me. I've seen so many children not given the opportunity to live up to their potential as human beings. And that's what Pat was trying to do for those students. Not just teach them particular subjects, but give them the potential uh, to live up to their capacity as human beings. And this is how the water is wide ends. Of the Yamakra, or Defusky children, I can say little. I don't think I changed the quality of their lives significantly or altered the inequitable fact that they were imprisoned by the very circumstance of their birth. I felt much beauty in my year with them. It hurt very badly to leave them. For them, I leave a single prayer that the river is good to them in the crossing. Beautiful line. Well, why is Pat fired from Defusky Island? There's actually a long list of charges that are put up against him when the school board decides not to renew his contract. And the central one is conduct, conduct on becoming a professional educator. But it also includes things like being AWOL, being away without leave, being late for work. Keep in mind that during most of Pat's time on Defusky Island, he wasn't actually living there. He was taking a boat over from Bluffton. He was late four times. That's pretty good, I think, when you're coming by boat. But the real problem was that Pat was doing his job too well. It was a time when educating African-American children in a way that was equal, perhaps even superior to the way that white children were being educated, was not welcome. And he wasn't doing it secretly. That was the other problem. He brought those kids into Beaufort, where the white citizens who were not prepared for integration not only saw that, but had to interact with it. So the school board uh, and Pat's administrators were not for him doing this. And he was given the opportunity to resign. If he had taken that, he could have applied to be a teacher elsewhere, and he would have had a little blemish on his record, but it probably wouldn't have stood in his way. But he was told that if he sued and lost that suit, he would never get a job as a, as a professional educator anywhere else. And he did sue, and he did lose, and he never got a job as a professional educator anywhere else. But he never stopped being a teacher, either. He was only in the classroom three years, but he was a teacher his whole life. This is Pat writing about teachers, writing in the voice of um, Tom Wingo in The Prince of Tides, but this is very true of Pat as well. There is no word in the language I revere more than teacher. My heart sings when a kid refers to me as his teacher, and it always has. I've honored myself and the entire family of man by becoming a teacher. When Pat passed away on March 4th of 2016, he got to enact what we come to think of as his last act as a teacher. And it has to do with where he's buried. This is Pat's gravesite. It's in St. Helena Memorial Gardens. Which, that virtue of map is right here on St. Helena. Now remember that earlier quote we had when we were talking about Miss Hunter. I was born to be in a library. Well, I think it's particularly fitting that the man who was born to be in a library 
is actually buried behind one because St. Helena Library is on the other side of the fence behind the graveyard where Pat is. But it's not just the library that was important to Pat in choosing the spot. It's this, it's Penn Center. Here's that library, by the way, on the grounds of Penn Center. How many of you have ever been out to Penn Center or at least know what that is? Oh, good, most of you, that's fantastic. Well, here's a shot of the original building, the Penn School, which was created uh, during the Civil War, during and after, to educate the newly freed African Americans. But Penn Center has had many lives. In the 1950s and 60s, it became a central site in the Civil Rights Movement. It was a place where whites and blacks could meet together freely. Uh, there were not many places like that. And it became a, a place where Dr. Martin Luther King would come and write. And there's an, a Martin Luther King cabin on the grounds at Penn Center where he wrote an early version of the I Have a Dream speech. Gene Norris, who we heard about earlier, took Pat out there as a young boy, 16, 17 years old. And here's what Pat wrote about that. It was at Penn Center that I met Dr. Martin Luther King on a street now named for him. I also met Ralph Abernathy, Andy Young, Jesse Jackson, Julian Bond, and the entire leadership of that fabulous civil rights movement that brought the South kicking and screaming into the 20th century. I watched my whole world change because of meetings that had taken place at Penn Center. I'm living proof that Penn Center can change a white boy's life. You changed me utterly, and I'm forever grateful to you. In choosing to be buried in a Baptist African American cemetery, and keep in mind, Pat is neither Baptist nor African American, Pat created a lesson because he had visited the graves of so many writers, Thomas Wolfe and others. He knew that his readers would come to see him at his gravesite. You can't get there without going through Penn Center. You've got to learn at least something about Penn Center to go to Pat's grave. So again, that's Pat as a teacher, one final time. We honor that site and that choice each year, and we'll be doing it this very Sunday, in fact, this uh, being March 4th, by taking the anniversary of Pat's death and turning it not into a day of mourning, but into a day of teaching. So we'll be out at Penn Center, and there are cards uh, for this event up front as well. For our second annual March 4th on March 4th, we'll be out there with National Book Award winning poet, South Carolina native, Nikki Finney, Two-time Lillian Smith Award winner, Tony Grooms. The Lillian Smith Book Award is an award given for books of social justice themes, very important. And master naturalist, poet, memoirist, uh, Drew Lamb. Pat's brother, Tim Conroy, now a published poet as well. And Pat's widow and fellow novelist, Cassandra King. You can sign up for that event on our website. And again, there are cards about the room. I'll give you a little more information about that. It's been a remarkable day last year, and we're expecting it to be a remarkable day this year as well. When I say we, I'm getting to this, finally. The Pat Conroy Literary Center, which is um, a nonprofit that was created after Pat passed away to honor Pat, not just as writer, but as teacher, as the thing we've been talking about. And here's a short video, about five minutes, about the creation of the center that'll give you a few glimpses inside our facility as well. than life. When he smiled, it lit up his whole face. 
and he had these really twinkling, just clear, clear blue eyes. I thought he was a very good looking man. There wasn't a single person that ever drew breath that Pat wasn't interested in. He had to greet the receptionist. He talked to every single person in the hall. He treated every single person as though he had flown all the way from Beaufort, South Carolina to see them. Uh, it was an extraordinary thing to watch. He could remember everything. He could remember something you told him 10 years ago, or he could start telling you about something he had seen or something that he had read, and it was just so clear. And he just brought everything to life. The fact that Pat wrote in the first person voice gave him a direct contact and a connection with every reader. You felt that he was talking to you. People wrote to Pat to say that your books saved my life. And it was something profound and, and deeply felt. Well, the great strength of Pat's writing was his ability to extract universal themes from his own personal story. So people from all over the world feel as though they know Pat and feel as though they know Buford. And when they come to the center, they immerse themselves in that world. Pat was a lifelong learner and encouraged it of everybody. And he didn't just encourage you if you were a writer. He encouraged you no matter what your life was. When Pat died, in March of 2016, there was talk of how best can you commemorate this larger-than-life figure who meant so much to so many people. Pat Conroy, as we knew him, was a man of action. So the conversation changed to what can we do that's active, that honors Pat. It was very easy to decide what we needed was a literary center that would offer the kind of support to young writers, to older writers, for anyone who's struggling to find their voice, anyone who has something to say and needs the support of a community. We're excited to be able to offer the number of classes that we can for writers and for readers, uh, increasingly for students as well. But all of that needs financial support to continue and to grow across the country, across the globe, ultimately. I can pretty much guarantee that anyone who walks out of that center or anyone who closes a Conroy novel will feel and know that they are not alone in the world and that Pat Conroy is there to make us all feel that way. The Literary Center SWAT Pat was, and as long as we have the center to carry on what Pat started, then his, his legacy will live on. giving the rest of you something to do. Then. <laughs> Let me show you a little bit more about the center, and uh, we're headed toward our opportunity for questions here. We do have a physical location, which you saw in that video. We're at 308 Charles Street in Buford, just a block off Bay Street, open to the public uh, currently four days a week, Thursday through Sunday, from noon to four. But even though we're only open to the public four days a week, the public has this habit of showing up seven days a week. <laughs> and if, uh, if I'm there or Maura, who works with me, is there, we're happy to let folks in and do a tour off hours as well. The room that we're looking at, we affectionately refer to as Pat's office. This is his desk and his chair from Fripp Island. Uh, some part of all of Pat's books from Music, <coughs> Music Forward were written at that desk, longhand, generally. Because Pat never learned to type, of course, given his father had forbidden him from doing that. There's this strange little metal thing you can see over here, and I want to show you just a little clip about that because I think it's important. So much of what we have comes from existing materials, uh, Pat's personal collections, family materials, Pat Conroy archive, but new things are also being created specifically for the Conroy Center, and this is one of them. So let's look at that. Please do the unveil. Oh, wow. Helping to preserve the legacy of Pat Conroy, 
Golding students at May River High School unveiled the donation box they created for the Pat Conroy Literary Center in Buford. Conroy's widow says the famous author would be impressed. They would have loved it. They would have gotten such a hoot out of it. It would have meant so much to them. For one thing, that students uh, did it and came up with the idea and the notion, and then all that it represents with the um, I was telling them, you know, having the South Carolina outline of the state as the base, I would have never thought of that. I knew it had to have a base to stand in. And then the palm tree, and of course a book. The center knew they wanted the students to help with this project because of Conroy's ties to the educational community. Pat was a teacher here in Beaufort, um, one of his first jobs, and we just wanted to make sure that we had cooperative effort between the students and the center. The box was constructed at May River High School. Sparks flying around the room is a common sight at the state of the art welding facility where the design took shape. I wanted to think outside the box and make it look like a look to represent Pat Conroy. Uh, another element was looking at South Carolina. We all love the palm trees, and I wanted to showcase the base of South Carolina and use palm trees as well as the book. During the ceremony, an audio recording of Conroy was played and one of the students read a passage from his book, My Reading Life. The donation box will be placed right next to Conroy's desk. This box is really important. I'm really proud to be able to um, go wherever I go after high school and be able to say that I left something here in the low country. I think it's a huge honor to be able to make something for someone who had a, such a big part in Buford's history. Seven students worked on the donation box. It took about two weeks to complete. In Buford, Ron Lopes, Buford County School District. It's a, it's a pretty incredible piece. And when they brought it in, it had this rattle to it. And I asked Mr. Childress, their teacher, who you see in the photo there, is this broken already? Is something going to be fixed on this? And he said, well, here's what happened. Our class meets after lunch. And since we built the box, the kids have been putting their change from lunch into it. So they delivered it with a donation already inside it, and they leave that in it as, a, as good luck token in its way. The other room, our other gallery room, has materials from the Pat Conroy archive, which Pat created while he was still among us uh, in partnership with the USC libraries. And we have handwritten manuscript pages from Pat, correspondence and photos as well. What we're looking at here in this photo are the handwritten opening pages to the prologue to the Prince of Tides, exactly as the ink hit the page. What amazes me as an editor and publisher is nothing's crossed out. No <laughs> in the margin. He did all that in his head. Not early on, but something that's a skill that Pat internalized over time. But he was able to basically self-edit in his head. So when he put the word on the page, it was the word he intended to be there. It's not to say he wasn't edited after the fact, of course, but in the drafting stage, more often than not, pages are in fact this clean. See this quilt in the corner there? Let's get a better look at that. That was made by the younger of the two Conroy sisters, Kathy Harvey, who is our docent every single Sunday. Kathy made that quilt for Pat as a 70th birthday present. He used it during the last months of his life. We also have this beautiful full wall mural and a writing desk painted by Akit Kato, a Japanese-born artist who makes his home in Buford as well. We've had more than 2,000 visitors since we opened in October of 2016, and they've come from everywhere. We think of them as literary pilgrims. There are 38 states and nine countries represented in our guest book. We are a nonprofit, as I mentioned, which means we're funded entirely by gifts and grants. And we've been very fortunate to get grants from folks like the South Carolina Humanities and South Carolina Arts Commission, Barbara Streisand Foundation and the Hootie and the Blowfish Foundation, as well as a number of local community foundations and private family foundations as well. Virtually everything we do, including today's event, is all done in partnership with another entity. We're a small organization, but we're very fortunate to have good partners who help us along. And those include the Beaufort County School District and the Citadel which Pat would find fascinating because he didn't have a particularly good relationship with either of those two. But uh, Pat believed in circles, that in time everything comes back around. He thought it was true of people. It seems to be true of institutions as well. And I want to take you through a couple more slides about the center. Uh, we are 
We were selected as South Carolina's first and currently only affiliate member of what I think of as the mothership, the American Writers Museum, which means that in Chicago, Illinois, in that museum, we are featured in the affiliates room, and we do the same for them by talking about them at events like this. And we're the only one in South Carolina. We are also South Carolina's second American Library Association United for Libraries Literary Landmark. This beautiful plaque is on the front of the center building now. The second, the first literary landmark uh, is at USC in Columbia. And it was given appropriately enough to one of Pat's teachers, James Dickey, honoring, honoring his place on that campus. So it's appropriate that the second one went to Pat, I think. Well, these awards, both of them, the American Writers Museum Award and the uh, Literary Landmark, those are given not just for having a museum, an interpretive center, but also for doing public programming like we're doing here today. We held our first public program almost a year ago, President's Day of last year, and it was a Poets Respond to Race Forum held in partnership with an African-American church just down the street from us in Beaufort, Grace Chapel AME. We had seven poets come do a reading to talk about race relations. Are any of you poets by chance? No? Good. We can talk freely and correctly about poets. That's good. That's helpful. I was a, a publisher of poetry for a long time, so I've been to a lot of poetry readings, and I've learned this sort of uh, guiding principle is, and, and, and poets, I think, would back me up on this. If you're at a reading and there's one more person in the audience than you have poet on the stage, that's a good day. <laughs> you can go home and feel good about that. We had seven poets, some of the best in the state. So we were hoping optimistically to have eight people in the audience. We would have been really happy with that. We had 200 people show up that night. We filled that church to capacity, and it started a partnership with that church and with other entities that continues. We have a visiting writers series, uh, which we did virtually every month last year, and we'll re be restarting this summer of this year. Rather than just bring a writer from somewhere else to talk about their book for an hour, we put them in conversation with a local writer. So it's instructional, it's educational. This, by the way, Valerie Sayers, once again, who has come and been a moderator for this series. And tomorrow night we'll be doing one of these on Hilton Head at First Presbyterian Church. For the first time, we're putting uh, our visiting writers in conversation with each other. We have a book with co-authors, so they'll be carrying on the conversation together. Jacques Marrier and Estelle Ford Williamson talking about Seed of South Sudan, which is a memoir of one of the lost boys of Sudan. The 15th of March, we're doing, doing a slight variation on that, a book launch for Christy Woodson Harvey, who is not a writer Pat ever met, but certainly one who was influenced by Pat. And you'll find details about this on our website, too. We're doing this a beautiful historic home in Beaufort, which has been uh, another wonderful partnership for us. In addition to just doing books for readers, we also, of course, do programs for writers. We do workshops for writers. This one here is happening in the center. This is one of the exhibit rooms. But we also do them elsewhere. Just a few weeks ago, we had our first writer's retreat with an all-star faculty, Mary Alice Monroe, Patty Callahan Henry, Cassandra King, all New York Times bestsellers, uh, Sidney Pike from Charleston, fantastic novelist and memoirist and editor, and two of the best literary agents in the business, uh, Faye Bender and Pat's agent, Marley Russoff. And Mary Alice was so nervous about this. She was calling me a week before we were about to announce it, saying, maybe we should reschedule for the fall. I'm just not worried nobody's going to sign up for this in January. Sold out in less than a week. It was a phenomenal response, so much so that we're going to continue offering retreats like this throughout the year. And we have one coming up this very week that you can actually still sign up for on Hilton Head at the Hilton Head Island Beach and Tennis Resort. Uh, there are the options to take just the workshops or to sign up for a larger package as well. We've seen her before, by the way. This is Stephanie Austin Edwards, who was on the Breakers Literary Magazine staff with Pat. She's a teacher not just locally, but for us, for the Conroy Center as well. And our lead instructor, Jessica Handler, learned creative writing from Pat when he was a guest teacher at the Padilla School in Atlanta. So two of these three folks have Conroy connections as well. April is National Poetry Month. We'll be doing some readings uh, in partnership with local organizations uh, with the Island Writers Network on Hilton Head. And Pat's brother, Tim Conroy, is coming to be part of that as well. 
But our big event is our annual literary festival. How many of you have ever been to the Conroy Literary Festival before? Just a couple people. All right, something else for you to do then. Uh, well, these dates are obviously last year, since October of last year. And the festival has its own website, own Facebook feed as well. But I want to give you a little glimpse of who's coming this year because it relates back to our theme of Pat as teacher and student. And our dates this year will be the first week in October, or excuse me, in November, a little later than last year, first weekend in November, second through the fourth. How many of you have read Beach Music? Good. That's great. Well, Pat mentioned some bands in Beach Music, but one of the bands he mentions quite prominently is this group right here, the Red Clay Ramblers. They're coming. They're performing at the festival this year. Most of these guys are teachers. That's their day job. So like Pat, they are lifelong teachers, and we're thrilled to be able to bring them. Uh, anybody know who Sandra Brown is? Any Sandra Brown fans here? Yes. Uh-huh. She's had 70 New York Times bestsellers. She's not 70 years old. She didn't start writing when she was zero. She, her output is fantastic. She's a phenomenal writer. Kathleen Parker, anybody know who that is? Columnist for the Washington Post, Pulitzer Prize winner, South Carolina native. These are folks you wouldn't normally put together. They've got a couple things in common, though. One of them is Pat Conroy. They were both influenced by Pat as a writer, and he was friends with both of them. They have something else in common, too, that's part of the reason we invited them this year. They are both mothers of sons who write. Ryan Brown, anybody watch The Young and the Restless? Ryan's an actor as well as a writer. Sandra Brown's son. He wrote a, a novel about a zombie football team called Playing Dead, and Pat Conroy gave him some great advice for that book that made it possible. Kathleen's son, John Connor Cleveland, is a communications writer of sorts. But at 17, when he was just thinking he might want to be a writer, Kathleen brought him to Beaufort to meet her friend, Pat Conroy. And very much like young Pat's experience with Archibald Rutledge, Pat spent the whole day with John Connor Cleveland, taking him around town, showing him his writing room, introducing him to Gene Norris, who's still alive at the time, basically replicating that Archibald Rutledge experience. So what Pat promised Gene Norris, that he would be nice to every kid he met who wanted to be a writer, he was doing that, certainly. John Connor Cleveland is just one example. So we're excited to bring uh, both of these fantastic writers, Sandra and Kathleen, to the festival this year. We've got something else in common, though, and they actually have it in common with me because we're all contributors to a book that's coming out this fall called Our Prince of Scribes. Writers Remember Pat Conroy, edited by me and a Charleston writer named Nicole Seitz, featuring a couple of people you might recognize, forward by Barbara Streisand. That's fun to say. I'm never going to get tired of saying that. Afterward by Cassandra King Conroy. There are about 70 writers in all. What they have in common is Pat Conroy. Many of them don't know each other, but they all knew Pat. And that book will be a central piece of the festival this year. Well, the Conroy Center continues to get fan mail, just as Pat did in his life. It's pretty remarkable what it's come to mean to people. And I want to share one of those letters with you in closing. And after that, I'm happy to take your questions. It's an amazing letter uh, for a number of reasons. But more than anything else, it's amazing because of who sent it. Because this guy sent it. We got a letter from 23-year-old Pat Conroy in October of 2016, which was strange because Pat was dead at the time. Uh, you don't typically get mail from the deceased. But an archivist working at Newberry College found a letter that Pat had written in 1968 to Bill Duffer. Remember him, high school principal? Pat wrote this letter to Bill in 68, and they were the only two people who read it until October of 2016 when it was rediscovered. 68, if you'll remember, was Pat's first year of teaching at Newford High School. He had just finished that first year. He was going uh, to Europe to join a couple of other first year teachers for their big European adventure. He was going part of the way by boat, so he had a lot of time on his hands. And being introspective, Pat Conroy, he was writing letters at that point. One of those to Bill Duffer. It's an incredibly beautiful, moving letter about what it's like to be a first year teacher. It's written in earnest because Pat was stepping into the profession he thought he would always have. He thought he was going to be a teacher forever. 
and he was writing a letter to the person who had inspired him to be a teacher. But one of the amazing things about Pat's writing, and it's true of this letter, is that he had the ability to write about one place and one time, and somehow it's true of all places and all times. And that letter from 1968, when we found it in October of 2016, also read like it was written about that moment, about the Conway Center. Y'all want to know what's in the letter? <laughs> Just checking. Thought maybe it had somewhere to be. This is from the end of the letter. Closing paragraphs. Everything I have done since leaving Buford has been a reflection of the summer I spent with you, digging those damn ditches, painting those damn bookcases. I've never understood the dynamics of hero worship. Maybe it was the discovery of the father I never had as a youth and finally found in you. A father who was not only stern but tender, a father of both the storm and the sun. It is important for you to know this effect you have had, and I believe you know it, but in the shortness and horrible brevity of life, I want to get everything said. Everything. Someday I will exert the same influence over someone, and I want him to tell me. This is immortality. For what I have learned from you, I will pass on and it will be passed on, and it will be passed on, and passed on. That's Pat Conroy, 23 years old. Mm -hmm. That's effectively the mission sent, uh, statement of the Pat Conroy Center. That's what we get to do every day. That's what we're doing here right now. We're taking the lessons that Pat learned from his teachers and shared with his readers and his students, and we're making sure they continue to be shared and it is my absolute honor to be able to do that for someone who is my friend, and my mentor, and my teacher. So I want to thank you all for your attention. Thank you.